Uh, thank you very much uh, and good morning everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Gutter. I'm a faculty member, associate professor, and state extension specialist for family financial education at the University of Florida. Um, as many of you may be familiar with my name, I've worked with the Military Family Learning Network for over a year and a half now, um, and I've been a regular host of a lot of these uh, monthly web conferences, but this time apparently I got put in the hot seat. Uh, so I will be uh, presenting and also trying to do my best to stay up on top of questions today. Um, as always, uh, you know, I want to thank everyone for joining. Um, one thing you may not have known about me, I know some of you have seen my bio before, but uh, as I was putting together a little bit of this case study, I had a lot of help from my pop. Um, and, and my dad, uh, you know, served for many years uh, in, in the military, uh, was, 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 a, um, was a corporal first class, or I'm sorry, specialist first class over um, in Okinawa, of course, during the war. Um, and then I served for many years, actually, in the National Reserves, and uh, I remember quite a few summers uh, going to visit him up in Mackinac Island and such. So my dad spent some time making sure I understood a few things, and so hopefully we'll get that right today. Uh, I welcome your input today. I'm hoping we'll have some dialogue back and forth, so it'll be interesting with the chat window uh, to make sure you guys participate as much as possible. Um, again, uh, today we'll be focusing on uh, financial statements and record keeping first. We're going to talk a little bit about this. This is the first of two web conferences, actually, that we're doing on this subject. So today we're going to talk about um, some sort of advanced record keeping and advanced financial statement preparation issues. Um, we're going to focus not only on the common financial statements a lot of us have learned about, but hopefully introducing a few new ones uh, that we use to really understand the nuts and bolts of what's going on with our, with our uh, families. Uh, financial situations. So we'll be talking about that. Next week, we're going to follow up and talk more about diagnosing uh, different financial situations. And we'll be doing a lot of uh, understanding, number one, about how to calculate and estimate certain financial ratios, how to interpret them, and how to turn those into actionable items. So uh, again, thank everyone for joining us for that, of course. Um, if, if, you, if, you, if you're new to uh, Manly Military Family Learning Network, I wanted to make sure that, of course, you knew all about uh, some of our new resources. Um, we are, of course, in the social media universe, and we'd love it if you joined us there. Uh, you can join us on Facebook, of course, at Personal Finance for PFMs. Uh, we have a blog site, of course, run a lot by Molly Herndon, as well as with some guest bloggers. Um, and uh, again, you can find that. It's on Personal Finance at blogs.extension.org. And of course, our website, extension.org slash military families. And uh, you can look for us a lot on Twitter, uh, hashtag MFLN or MFLNPF. Uh, oftentimes we'll be out there. Um, and so I'm on uh, Twitter, of course, as is other members of my team. Uh, and so this year I'll be working a lot with all of you uh, on personal finance, web conferences, and online learning opportunities. Uh, as you know, one of our other team members, Barbara O'Neill, who is not able to join us today, but many of you know Barbara, of course, uh, who's presented in the past. And I also wanted to take the time to introduce Molly Herndon, who's on. And you might see her, of course, in the chat window. And Molly does a lot of the nuts and bolts for things for us, especially in the social media universe. So uh, I wanted to just make sure that you all had a sense of the people that are involved. And uh, then without further ado, um, let me also mention a critical point that many of us want to know. Um, this is an AFC, uh, uh, this is eligible for AFC CEUs. Um, so just to make sure the AFC credential participants will earn one and a half CEUs by participating in this 90 minute web conference and following these simple instructions. Number one, uh, there's going to be two passwords given throughout the presentation. You'll want to make sure that you jot those down. Um, that's a requirement for getting the CEUs is to include those in there. Uh, and then you'll need to send both of those words in an email to the email address that we're going to give at the end of the presentation. And also in there, if you could include your first and last name or if your signature line has all of that, that's fine. Uh, but we just want to make sure that we have your identity. As you know, sometimes email addresses don't really give us the name of someone. So, uh, and of course, if you have any questions about the CEU process during the web conference, I will certainly take those, of course. Uh, you can direct those to myself or Molly, uh, and we'll be glad to work with you on that process. <clears throat> so, pardon me. Uh, so, to move it forward and keep us a little bit on track, let me uh, begin then just by thinking a little bit about this. And that's number one, why do we need financial records? So we can get a lot into sort of the behavioral economics and the psychology of this and the flaws with mental accounting, um, which, you know, if we had all the time today, I would certainly do that. But really what's really important for us when we're working with families, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or even in group settings, is that records help to serve as reference points. Uh, they give us specific information that we need oftentimes to make well-informed decisions. 
So um, from you, a financial planner, a financial counselor, a coach, can help someone map a plan to their financial goals. Uh, and so records also then can help us to track and make evidence of progress. So everything from tracking some of our resources, looking at how our income changes, how our assets change, which we'll spend a lot of time on this today, as you can imagine, uh, as well as also taking a look and thinking about our liabilities and how well we are in terms of making progress towards our objectives. You know, the challenge without having specific records actually written down or in a computer or somewhere that we can look at them is that it means that everything that we have then is in our heads. And that can also mean in a family situation, we don't all have exactly the same picture. Because without flawless communication, which I know every family has, but I'll admit it and say mine does not necessarily um, have flawless communication, that is, mental accounting where I'm trying to keep track of what I do and what my wife is trying to keep track of what she does uh, can prove to be really challenging because we're not psychic despite our best beliefs. Um, and so we don't really have the ability to just share that information with each other. So tracking it, keeping actual records is something that helps to take everything that's just up in our heads and allows us to put those down on paper uh, or electronically so that we're able to share them. And, and again, whether today I may deviate between when I say things on paper or electronically, I can assure you most of the time it's sort of whichever one you would prefer. There isn't really a right or wrong for these types of financial records. Uh, it's just having them is the first step, we would always say. So records help a lot of everyone that we work with. They help different financial services providers, such as insurers or lenders, ascertain the value of assets and debt. They help families make informed decisions then about whether or not they need insurance, whether or not they're making good track or progress towards their goals, uh, and many other factors too. So when we think about records, there's a lot of them out there, right? So there's these records that are gonna be given to us all the time, prepared statements, if you will. And then we have a lot of created statements that we're gonna have for ourselves. And you know, the three most common ones that we often talk about with families that they make for themselves are going to be balance sheets, income and expenditure statements, and budgets. Now, what are some examples though of prepared statements? And I'll give you a hint, this is the interactive part. So what are some examples of prepared statements that families need to probably uh, be mindful of when they're getting them? So what are some things that are prepared for families? Good, purchase receipts, Jerry, fantastic. Joe, credit card statements, excellent, sir. Uh, Connie, I love it, bank statements, without question, for all different types of accounts, because different accounts are for different purposes, for sure. Retirement accounts, very good, Pam, absolutely. Uh, investment balances, sure, without question. Keeping track of them both from the statements we have and if we need more up-to-date information using spreadsheets or other information. Uh, let's see some others here that we have. Uh, investments, mutual fund statements. Oh, Brenda, thank you. Tax records, absolutely. We've got to keep those. Jamie, property tax statements, without question. Um, these are real, real important statements that we all need to keep track of. And, and we get them pretty regularly. A lot of times we struggle with what to do with them. How long do we need to keep them? Uh, and that's you know certainly a challenging question. And we're gonna explore that a little bit today as we just kind of go through these various uh, documents that we need to have and where we keep track of them. And oh my goodness, absolutely, estate documents, really uh, title, things that have property titles associated with them as well. Um, and with estate documents, is, you know that includes everything like wills, trusts, letter of last instruction, uh, so many other things. And of course, even advanced directives that individuals may have had. And so there's the question of who needs to keep those, where people need to keep track of those. Paychecks, uh, absolutely. And so for our families, we want to help them to think about these records and thinking about, you know, different types of basic recommendations for how long people keep things. Now, you know, someone will say, well, what if I need this 10 years from now? And there's lots of what if statements. So the recommendations we have are just sort of some baseline things to have people think about keeping things at least this long. It doesn't mean you have to throw away things after the time that we said. It just means I wouldn't necessarily throw them away before that. Um, so these are going to be some sort of minimum guidelines we'll establish here. But that was really great. Thank you. So you guys got a bunch of them, right? Credit report, tax returns, prepared financial statements, all the sorts. And then, of course, these uh, ones that we make ourselves. So let's just review a few of these here and take a look at some of the ones that are somewhat common. So with tax documents, we often keep these from three to seven years. Now with each of these, we talk about keeping things in a filing cabinet. And I wanna tell you that in my life, I have two types of filing cabinets. So I have a nice metal one with a lock on it that sits in my office uh, at home. And we have things somewhat organized, somewhat to be honest, right? With tax documents together, 
Uh, and these are all relatively stable. Uh, you know, the, the, the box we have costs us a little bit of money. It's fireproof. Uh, things are in sealed envelopes so that they're waterproof. Uh, so we've done a lot of those pieces for it. But I have another filing cabinet that uh, is sort of a backup to those. Um, so what other types of filing cabinets do you guys have? So I have that one in my room, but I'm going to tell you that I have one in cyberspace. Um, you know, uh, you know we, ha we have a lot of these things scanned in as well. Uh, the tax documents on TurboTax, we have the PDF files. So we have a lot of things like that that we also keep electronically. And we keep these in a secure filing cabinet too. Uh, we make sure that if we're storing them online that they're in somewhere that has secure socket layer encryption uh, that's password protected uh, from a site that's reputable and has good, valid safe, uh, security certificates. Um, you know, other times people may keep these on a, uh, you know, on, um, excuse me, storage drives in their homes. Uh, but again, making sure if those are backed up or what, you know, whether or not they're protected against certain things, are they in surge protectors and things. So we see some of these different types of ideas. And I like, uh, I see some great documents here. Uh, Jerry also recommends some digital documentation. Uh, guess two, uh, thumb drives, very good. Uh, David Brett, USB thumb drive backup. And I like those. A word on the USB drives is you can have those be encrypted or password protected. And I strongly recommend that uh, for secure personal documents that you make sure that these are that you're now recommending to people that we would have these with password protection. I'm sure everyone meant that. I'm just specifying it for the good of the group. Um, yep, and I see it there, an encrypted thumb drive in a safe. That's, that's a great one, Jerry. I think that, and that ought to do it too. Uh, safe deposit boxes are going to be great for certain things as well. Um, I like this, a small safe that is portable in case of a need for an emergency. Uh, and we've got that too, William. That's a great one people think about too, especially for some of the documents that we need to have on hand in the event of an emergency. And then, uh, Zenaida, I apologize if I mispronounce that. Um, but again, uh, make sure also that you do have someone else, who, safety person who might have the password too. And there's a, often a logical person for this. I mean, if it's not a spouse or partner, they certainly might need this. But we might also think if there's someone that we have that would be acting in our behalf, that they have a power of attorney on our behalf already, or they have some other fiduciary connection to us, um, that that's someone else that we probably think it's safe to have. We're already entrusting them with the ability to pay our bills. So we may as well think about them, of course, at this point as well. So, <clears throat> so documentation as well for things, IRA contributions can be important to hold, and a lot of times this is just because once we eventually take money out of the IRA, our accountant may need specific documentation, so we strongly recommend keeping a lot of those things. And the same can be true for a lot of retirement plans, that keeping a lot of these documents, especially the document purchases that are made, may be important for future tax purposes. Um, brokerage statements, for example, until securities are sold, uh, are really important as well that we hold on to those. And with all of these, we want to hold a lot of these in very similar places. Um, and just, uh, and uh, I will remind everyone too, uh, this uh, table um, without all the colors does appear on an EDIS publication that was put ahead in the readings for today. So you do have access to this table in a PDF document that has it. Uh, so just in case you wanted to take a peek at that later on, or if this is a resource you'd ever want to share with families. Again, with a lot of other resources too, these are all sort of minimum levels. So for bills and receipts, you know, one year, and if it's something that's going to be ongoing, especially for different types of debts we might have, we want to keep those. A lot of times with various debts, we want to keep them long enough from a minimum of 45 days if it's all paid off, but really up as long as seven years, depending upon our credit records and what it is we want to have. So thinking in terms of always being able to match up our statements with what's in our credit reports. Final statements, for example, usually at least seven years from the payoff date. So when you get the notification that a particular loan was paid off, I don't know about you guys, but I framed this. The first time I paid off a car, I actually had this framed up at my house for a while, and then my wife informed me that was a little tacky. Um, but I have a lot of things like that that I think, you know, again, it's, we shouldn't, you know, it's important that we do keep track of those to make sure that uh, that's well documented and well taken care of uh, you know, at, least, at least seven years from then to make sure nothing's challenged. Uh, check stubs, and in this case, you know, a lot of times this may be sort of a moot point if we're not using a lot of checks. Many of us use bill pay uh, procedures or other types of uh, mechanisms. And so for that, we're mostly thinking about keeping track of a lot of email transactions, which has become sort of a new phenomenon I think some of us have had in our work. And uh, Zenaida had, had a question, of course, too, and um, there isn't any voice capability, but if you do have comments or questions, please feel free to type them into the uh, chat box. We love comments and feedback. At least I do. Um, so, and then again, this was another 
this was again with another important thing too. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, also, you know, just someone was mentioning earlier, making sure that we had a trusted person who had all of the documentation, the passwords, and this is another one also. Uh, the names and addresses of all the different financial institutions that we're working with. And here we give examples of, you know, savings accounts and checking accounts. But I think most of us would agree this includes insurance policy holders as well um, and keeping track of that information, which I think we mentioned a little bit later on, too. So that's real important to keep track of. I mean, these are th things we may need for our lifetime because anyone who has power of attorney may need access to this information to be able to act on our behalf with our assets, liabilities and such. And of course, uh, where to keep them. Uh, again, we've talked about things like filing cabinets, fireproof boxes, safe deposit boxes. Again, what's real important is that somebody has access to this who would need it. Um, home ownership records, a minimum of six years, right? Uh, but then of course, uh, up through permanently, uh, certainly until we dispose of the home oftentimes. And again, thinking about where we would keep all of these records, very similar places. Records associated with our debts. Um, again, until the debts, once they're paid off and we get those final statements, then we keep them for a few more years, those final statements, and uh, go from there. Um, so, and again, uh, Catherine, if you have a comment, please feel free to uh, chime on in uh, and share it in the chat window. We'd love to have it. And then lastly, these uh, additional documents here, certificates of birth, death, marriage, divorce, um, all of those things, we're going to keep those permanently, of course. Names, addresses, phone numbers, um, legal advisors, financial professionals that we're working with. Uh, these are things that are going to be need to be accessible to our loved ones for the lifetime and accessible to us. We don't necessarily memorize all of these people. We may know our life insurance company, but we may not talk to our agent all the time. So just keeping track of the right people we need to reach out to uh, if the time comes. So this is a really great one. Uh, Catherine had a wonderful question, and this is really important too, and I, and I encourage others to chime in on this question. I'll tell you my opinion, Catherine, for this, of course. Um, so Catherine's question was, where do we suggest single Marines leave papers when deployed with no family around? You know, that's a really important question. I think it, we start by thinking about who is it that they would trust um, with their last affairs. Um, so this may be a very trusted friend, um, potentially at least where they would let them have access to that information, letting them know where things are held, letting them know where things are stored. So the person that they're going to trust the most with that would be oftentimes the person who they would want to trust with this secret as well, if you will. Um, and that's really tough. So I mean, where they might keep them. So if we talk about physically where they might keep them, um, uh, in addition, Catherine, that might be uh, also where they think about using a safety deposit box. So someone, for example, who's on deployment, doesn't necessarily have a, a, a you know a residence at home if their if their parents are, have passed or they're not around. Um, again, just given your question, you know I would think a safety deposit box might be worth the investment. They're not necessarily for a simple box too expensive, um, so that would probably be my single greatest suggestion for that purpose as well. And then again, there's a record of that being there at the financial institution, which helps. And then it's mostly a function of the person whom they would trust to oversee those affairs they would need to make sure it was also on file or had permissions from the financial institution. So that would be one I would think about there too. Um, you know, Jerry's comment about an attorney, uh, again, I think yes, especially if it's someone who we're hiring, uh, you know, to be in charge of these last wishes, um, if this was a trustee, for example, or others, that's sort of the person who, person who we might see as being an executor, administrator for, for what we do have. That's really a little por uh, person there. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, pardon me there. Um, yes, and, and uh, Betsy's comment too, I think that's great. I mean, seeing the legal assistance officer there, um, you know, just in terms of getting, making sure that uh, in the event of casualty assistance, that's a real important point. And so using those local resources, uh, those base resources is very important. Um, passports, of course, same thing too, keeping those, you know, whether they're on hand, of course, which I tell everybody, you know, given where you might be, you might be keeping your papers on hand. Um, and then any other things too, copies of critical letters, letters of appointment um, for positions, letters of appointment for property, or other legal documents that uh, have uh, different types of appoint, uh, have different types of placement. Um, again, permanently or as long as needed, as long as they're going to be relevant. Now, Absolutely. Zanaya, that's a wonderful comment, too. So when we set up things like budgets and such like that, or as, as people start making recommendations, that's an important thing to think about because that might be a semi-regular or occasional expense that a family, an individual or family member has. So we want to make sure they have those. 
Um, oh, I like this too. Expired passports can be used as a form of idea, ID, so make sure you do keep them. Don't just throw them out or destroy them. So we're going to begin um, the next portion of today's presentation, and this will actually bleed into next week's web conference. As we mentioned, this was a two-parter. Um, and so we're going to begin just by meeting our case study family here. So let me just introduce you to them. Um, we have Brett and Brittany, who were re uh, recently married, but have been together for almost a decade. They have a house together close to a military base in a marital property in Midwestern State. They have a two-year-old son named Sam and a dog named Fluffy together. Brett's 28 years old and Brittany's 25. The family's in good health. Brett serves as an active soldier. He holds the rank of corporal and is at pay grade E4. Brittany loves her career as a nurse. Brittany has, a school loan, has school loan debt and Brett has some credit card debt too. They each have a car. One is owned and one is financed. Their primary goal is to make sure Sam has a funded college education. That's one of their most important things. Uh, they want to stay, make sure they stay, pay, stay current and pay off their house mortgage and save for retirement. And they have no plans at the moment to move, but they always know that this could be a possibility. So a little bit about their income. Brittany makes about $900, um, and we'll take a look at her annual salary. Uh, and uh, Brett makes about $24,0330 monthly uh, based on the current pay scales. Um, and they are entitled to some housing and substance allowances, um, which we've accounted for as well. And again, they each have retirement plans. Uh, Brett is participating in the TSP, and Brittany has a 401k plan from an employer. And they do have a small college fund set up for Sam at $2,000. So um, again, uh, these are just some of the things that they have here right now, uh, just putting things forward. So just so we're going to be taking a look at this family, and we're going to be prepared. We're going to look at some prepared financial statements for them, including some of what we'll refer to as decomposition statements. Um, I want to also point out, though, that we're going to ask you guys to maybe try your hand at this a little bit for next week and share your results with us. Uh, and then next week, we'll be taking the statements that we've worked with this week, and we'll be learning how to then uh, assess them, how to work with them, how to interpret some of the numbers that we have on them. So again, uh, the importance of financial statements, number one, uh, they help us to understand the resources available to a client. That's critical, of course. Um, how resources were acquired, another key aspect of this what the client has accomplished financially utilizing these resources. So we can have a little bit of all of this then with our financial statements that we can work from. So with families, right, they can benchmark goal achievement. Uh, so there's things we can use financial statements for that we're working with families, and there's things that families can work with too. So for example, if you're helping a family to set financial direction, Looking at existing prepared financial statements or ones that you and they help prepare together, uh, again, is something that can help to look at what are the obvious priorities. So we can think about things that people have and uh, wants and needs, but really what becomes important is that we start seeing that people really may need some prioritization. Uh, and financial statements can really help to spell out that level of fi pri financial prioritization. And then, of course, creditors, lenders can help make decisions to extend, continue, or even call indebtedness. If someone gets into trouble, then by understanding their financial situation, by having an accurate picture of what they can and can't do financially, it helps them to negotiate with lenders and creditors to possibly make amends so, or to make restitution. So of course, these, are, these documents can have many uses, right? So from the personal side of things, they can be helpful. From the uh, working with a family, they can help us, those who counsel and advise families, of course, on, from simple matters to uh, highly complex matters. And then, of course, they're really important for those that are going to do business, uh, lend money, and issue other types of uh, resources to our clients or our families. So, <clears throat> sorry about that. So, financial statements also then are a key aspect of the discipline of financial management. So, when we talk about financial management, we really focus many times on two key things, net worth planning and cash flow planning. So net worth planning then can be thought of as setting goals for net worth that are consistent with the established SMART goals. So what we're saying here is that in thinking ahead, if we've established SMART goals, and I know many of you have attended web conferences in the past, and certainly if uh, many of you with the AFC designation are, are very familiar with SMART goals, that oftentimes we can take a SMART goal and turn that into an actionable item for a family. So for example, we might say things like, well, a family is trying to be able to make this purchase next year. Well, the SMART goal would have helped us to establish and make that measurable. We then can look at that and say, well, if that's true, then really what amount of assets does the family need to have next year? So we start thinking about this from the structure of net worth planning. 
if we need to increase assets by a certain amount, right, so that net worth really increases, that's how we'll know that those funds are available for us if we were saving towards a goal. So we give ourselves an objective then for net worth. Uh, and that can be helpful because as we start making decisions, we'll be making sure, does this improve net worth? Does this hurt net worth? Does this have no effect on net worth? And so helping us to think in terms of that can give us a little bit of discipline in our financial decision making. The other thing I want to point out, too, uh, that we're going to continue to explore today is, of course, the critical relationship that all of this plays on cash flow planning. So when we think about managing inflows and outflows, all the cash flows that we have, so income comes into a household, and this may come in the form of uh, allowances that we might get, it might come in the form of paychecks that we might be getting, it might come from investment income, so on and so forth. We may have lots of different uh, flows coming in, if you will. And so what's really our key objection or key objective that we want to have when it comes to cash flow planning is maximizing the amount of money that's left over. Now, this is just from an efficiency standpoint alone, but it's also a little more practical than that. The amount of money that's left over from what we spend, well, what does that represent? So let me turn that over to you for a moment. When I have money left over from my spending, what is often that money? What can I use that money for? really leftover money, not stuff we forgot to spend money on, but real leftover expenses, real money that we didn't spend. Oh, you guys are making me happy. I love it. If you could see me, and next time I'll do video conferences, it's making me uh, have tears come to my eyes. This is exactly right. Of course, this is wonderful. Achieve goals. Fantastic, David. So we've got reducing debt. We've got investing, uh, which I love. We've got savings, uh, home improvements. So this is fantastic. You guys are right on the money. Emergency savings as well. I mean, this is really what we think about, right? That this, that discretionary cash flow, that money that we can leave, have left over. And if we're budgeting and paying ourselves first, then we make this money sort of come out earlier, right? That this is the money that we can use for all of those things, for meeting additional demands, for continuing to build up an emergency fund, for reducing debt. And by golly, what's exciting about that leftover money, that's right, I said by golly, right, is that we actually can use that money to increase net worth. And that's a really important part. That type of money can directly help us increase net worth. If I take that leftover income and I leave it in my bank account, then my net worth will be higher because of that, right? So, I mean, that's sort of the important way we start thinking about it, that we can keep that money in there and we've improved our net worth. If we put it into a savings account, our net worth can grow and it can earn a little bit of interest. If we invest it, it can earn a little bit more rate of return. If we pay off debt, we still improve our net worth. So these things are really exciting because those are real ways we can make a difference in managing our net worth with that money that we budgeted to have as a surplus. So we need to have that money and we need to build up things like emergency funds because we're budgeting, when we budget, we're budgeting for the things that we want, right? And this includes you know, the lifestyle that we want later on, being able to retire, being able to pay for our kids' college. These are all needs slash wants. I mean, we want those things to happen. But we also then have to, I love that somebody's bringing up emergency savings. Several of you did. So thank you, Amy and, and Hugh, uh, right? I mean, absolutely that having this leftover money allows us to build that discretionary savings, right? Build up that buffer that we need to have so that when the unforeseen happens, which inevitably it does, we are prepared or we at least have resources that we can call upon to increase our resiliency to the shocks to, to our resources. And these concepts that we're talking about right now, these are really important because next week we learn how we measure the adequacy of these, right? I mean, that's an important part. Right now we're talking about that this is really important, that this is what our money needs to be able to do. And next week we're going to focus on, does it do that? Is our money doing that for us? Are we seeing that in the results? Are we seeing that in the numbers? So again, uh, cash flow planning and net worth planning then are sort of inexorably tied is the way we think about this. Now let me pause. We're, uh, we're about a, a, a third in so far, so I just want to give everyone a chance to jot down the CEU password and a chance for me to take a sip of coffee. So do make sure if you're uh, applying for CEU credits for, through AFCPE that you jot this down. So again, the password is record. Well, or record. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, I'll leave that up just for just another moment. So again, make sure you have this password jotted down.
Okay. So again, uh, and, and thank, thank you, Tana. Um, again, so the, you will need to have all of the passwords to send in an email at the end of the web conference in order to obtain the CEU credit through AFCPE for the AFC designation. So again, make sure you're jotting these down because uh, we will have to uh, not allow, we will not accept CEU requests that do not have the passwords in the email. Okay, so do make sure you've got those. Um, give you guys a couple more seconds, and then I'm going to move on. I know it's just one word, but we're all that some of us had to find a pen, I'm sure. Okay, so. I want to talk now about the common financial statements that are out there. So I'm willing to wager that all of us have heard of the first two, right? So raise your hand for a second if you've heard of the first two, balance sheets and income and expense statements. So that's 38, nope, 39. Oh, some of us are figuring out how to raise the hand, which is cool. Keep going if you know. So if you know those first two. Now, keep your hand up if you've also heard of the fifth one, the budget. Now, the fourth, the third and the fourth one, statement of cash flows, which is nothing like an income statement, so it's not the one that most of us call a cash flow statement, um, but a statement of cash flows is a decomposition statement, and a statement of changes in net worth is also a decomposition statement that we use oftentimes for families. So keep your hand up if you're equally familiar with those other two statements. Otherwise, please put your hand down. So a lot more kind of in line with, with what we think. So uh, you can all put your hands down now. I, I'm glad that worked pretty well. I got to see a nice little posting thing of hands going up. It was kind of an interesting phenomenon, not what I've seen before. <laughs> so for some of us, this will be a little bit of review. And for others of us, we're going to be learning some uh, new types of statements that are out there. So uh, just to reiterate, too, in the interest of time, you know, we'll go through all of these. So I do want to uh, just, you know, for some of these, if these are a first time thing, uh, I'll recommend some additional readings and some follow up too to review uh, just to make sure you're really comfortable with these additional statements. They do uh, they do help. And I think we'll see the goal of them in just a few moments. So I'm going to begin. We're going to do a complete review, though, of these a little bit and just talk about balance sheets and income statements for just a few moments. And I want to talk about balance sheets. Um, in a really important and sort of new way, too, as we think about them. Now, the first thing I want to point out is that balance sheets and income and expenditure statements are really helpful things um, in terms of how they work. So when we think about a balance sheet, I always like to say that the thing to know about that is you're really taking a snapshot in time of someone's financial picture, right? So we get in one foul shot a picture of everything that they own and everything that they owe. An income statement, though, is going to be a lot more like a record of what transpired, right? So uh, a, an aggregation of all of sort of the transactions that took place, all of the money that came in, all of the money that went out, and helping us to understand where that went. Uh, and so we'll look at those, too. So I like to talk about those that getting control of those is a lot like, for some of us, controlling, controlling our diet. So a couple of years ago, my wife and I worked really hard to lose some weight together. Uh, we lost 50 pounds each together. It took a lot of effort and a lot of support, but we did. But it also took a lot of record keeping. So about once a week or so, we would step on the scale. Now, I know some of you would say, why not that, Why not every day? But that's just not my style. I also don't recommend you have a balance sheet or a credit report every day either. Um, so we don't need to look at things every day. Oftentimes, that's you won't see as much progress that way, and it can actually be frustrating. So we stood on the scale about once a week to see how that was. At a snapshot in time, that tells me where I am with my weight loss, right? So it's a perfect statement, if you will. And then we also kept track of what we ate. Now, now we have apps that do that. But back in the day, my wife and I were writing it down on a little piece of paper. 
In fact, we learned this awesome trick that I suggest everyone do for keeping track of whether it's dieting or more importantly, expenses, which I have all my students do, uh, which is take a sheet of paper and fold it in half and fold it in half and in fact, fold it in half three times. And then when you unfold it, you have a piece of paper that's got a lot of lines in it. Not very surprising. But what you'll find is it actually makes eight boxes. Um, so you can actually then have a box for every day to keep track of. So my wife and I took that piece of paper every week to keep track of things. And when we wanted to do the same thing for our money, we went right back to that same piece of paper for tracking everything. So we'll talk and explore that in more detail. Okay. So balance sheets and income and expenditure statements can have a lot to do with sort of the control of that critical record keeping. But then we're going to see that there's things that happen on one statement that aren't recorded well on another. Now, so we're going to define these decomposition statements in a little bit, but we already are familiar with the first two. How is a budget like an income statement and different from an income statement? So that's the interactive part again. I'm sorry. I know it's boring, but I have to ask you guys questions. I, I like teaching that way. Um, so how would you say a budget is different than an income and expenditure statement? Great. So some, some of you, I love these answers. I'm going to pick on uh, pick one of my favorite answers, if that's okay. Joe, I'm going to take your answer. This was great. Income statement shows actual expenditures. A budget is a plan. Love it. Great way to think about it, right? That the income and expenditure statement is, is what's a record of what did happen. The budget is the plan for what we want to happen next, right? And then we track the budget to see how well we're matching up so that we can. Someone mentioned you could, you could, you could reconcile those month to month to see every month. Is my budget on track, right? Am I, did I spend what I thought I would? And so those of us who have been in organizations do that. Families should do the same type of thing, right? When we think about how much we're trying to spend, especially in the beginning as a family might be struggling financially, that month-to-month -month reconciliation of where we on budget or off budget is really important. And that's some of the importance that we're going to talk more and more about today. So that's really great. So Joe, I appreciate it. That was a really helpful comment. That's right, and that's, an, that, and that's a great one too. And we're going to talk about this notion also. Uh, our guest said uh, statements give you a readout of your income and outflows, but doesn't tell you how you're spending your money per paycheck to determine if you're in the red at any time. And that's right. And we would say that in general, for families that are really starting off and living paycheck to paycheck and starting off, that this needs to be much more of a monthly process, this reconciliation. As we're more on handle, we can track it more quarterly to make sure we're on track. But again, if you're, if you're not running into trouble, right, we can tend to start enjoying a little bit of the, our, our success by not having to do so much maintenance uh, if we're doing better at it. Um, but again, it's important to keep track of that and make sure we're not going in the red. So I think that was a really good comment. So let's just remind ourselves the personal balance sheet, right, a summary of your assets, what you own, uh, your, and of course, uh, and, and what you owe, right? So what you own, what you owe, and your net worth, the difference between the two. A lot of this... Um, and Catherine, this presentation will be archived, uh, recorded, so you'll absolutely be able to go back and catch it if uh, it's coming in and out. And I apologize for any technical difficulties. Uh, we certainly try and do our best. Um, so the balance sheet, as we said, I, I say think about it as a camera shot, right? We take a picture, and at that moment, we have it. Now, why is it at that moment? Because if I put my savings account balance on there, then within a week or two, a quarter or two, right, I could have got a little bit of interest depending upon the money I have and the interest rate I have. So again, that's just what we're going to keep seeing, that our, our financial position really changes period to period. Uh, those of us with investments can see that it can change a lot in a week or a month, right, just depending upon if the market does pretty, uh, has anything sort of craziness, if you will. Um, so why do we start with here? And the thing we always say is that the true picture of of someone's financial position will actually take the uh, two balance sheets along with an income and expenditure statement in between. And that's something we'll start kind of thinking about, that it's going to be that initial balance sheet is like stepping on a scale the first time and saying, okay, I want to trim up. So we have a sense of where we are when we begin the process, and therefore it becomes an excellent benchmarking tool for us. 
But at the same time, right, I mean, we want to think about that we're going to need to then keep track of that on a regular basis, keep plotting new data points to see do we continue to show progress, right? So if we were stepping on a scale, do we lose weight? And more importantly here, what would be our metric? Well, primarily over time that our net worth increases. It doesn't have to increase by gobs, but ideally if we had goals for our net worth, we want to be coming close to those over time. I like that. Uh, Rick Edelman, a quote here, it's not the money you make, it's the money you keep. And that's, and that's in, in short part of what we're saying, that the balance sheet is sort of going to be the great equalizer. What do we really have? And do we keep that over time and does it grow? Or do we really stagnate and really never grow our wealth, which a lot of families do. They don't necessarily ever grow wealth. They maintain a certain amount in uh, assets, but it never really gets substantial because uh, of a lack of commitment to saving, inefficiency of savings and investments, and of course people may just have bad market performance, but uh, that's you know sort of things that they can't necessarily have full control over. So let me just provide some key definitions. I like these. A lot of these are consistent and are based on several different textbooks. So I think many of you are familiar with Garmin and Forg as a, as a base textbook. So I am, uh, some of the material comes from there. The other book that I reference also throughout this presentation, and we'll make sure those are available in your references, is called Personal Financial Planning Theory and Practice um, uh, from, an, from an earlier edition as well. And so both of those books help to make sure that we do this. And that's because I think in your time, you've probably seen everyone doesn't have rigorous, you know, perfect definitions from textbook to textbook or presenter to presenter. So I'm trying to make sure my definitions are as consistent as possible across some of the different common texts that are used uh, in, the, in the area, in the field. So cash and cash equivalents, you know, liquid assets are the best way to think about these, easily converted to cash without substantial fees or cost, uh, really can convert to cash within a short time frame as well. So those are some common things we would think about. So when we think about what this exists, um, and I think you'll, next week we'll clarify why this is so important, but for now many of you already know enough. These are things that are available for emergencies, they're available for what we have for consumption purposes. So this is an important category for us because it's the money that somebody really has access to. So, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to click that. So some cash and cash equivalents, what are some common ones that we might see then? What are some common things that we would tend to see that are cash and cash equivalents on a balance sheet? So CDs, especially if they're short term in nature, that's really important. Um, savings accounts, that's a great one. So a three year CD we might question sometimes because converting them to cash may not be all that cheap. But certainly we think about short-term CDs without question. Uh, savings accounts are great. Cash on hand, absolutely. Uh, Joe's, money market funds, that can be great. An iPad that can be pawned. Almost pretty liquid right now, it would seem, although it depends upon which iPad it is, I'm being told now. Um, so money that we have, money that we can get there. I often say, you know, you can count on if it can, usually if it's not a credit card and it can come out through an ATM machine, that's pretty liquid. So there's lots of things like that that we can help to keep track of. And this just helps us understand this is the money that's going to pay the bills uh, most of the time, right? So when we look, go to assess this later, we think this is the money that's really on hand for an individual. Now, this is, when we think about this, this asset and the next asset are what we call financial assets. So cash and cash equivalents are a financial asset, but the other category of financial assets is invested assets. Right, so this is stocks, bonds, mutual funds, real estate, and most of the time on a balance sheet for a family, these are listed by account. They're not listed necessarily by each individual holding. So if they have uh, a 401k plan or a TSP with two or three different funds that they might be holding in it, um, different trusts, for example, you know, the balance sheet would likely just list the total in the TSP or the 401k plan. We would likely have a separate assessment for the individual investment performance that way. So, um, but you know, you might have multiple investment accounts. So as we'll see in our family's case, you know, they each have retirement accounts um, and uh, you know, him and her as well. And so that's things that they're going to have. And we'll see there's other invested assets. So one of the ones we didn't list here that we know is mentioned in the case study is education accounts for kids. And often those should still be in the parents' names because a four, 529 plan, right, the child is the beneficiary of the account, but usually the parents or grandparents are sort of the owners of the account. So we just like to put some of those things into perspective too, where those might go for the family. So invested assets, we want to try and put those in. So when we talk about the amounts we put on for these, 
Again, we're typically thinking about the amount on the day that we're making the balance sheet. It's supposed to be a snapshot in time. So we don't want to take the best investment performance we had over the year and use that for the balance sheet. If we're making a balance sheet on January 1st, then that's really, we want to take the most recent market value for those assets. As, as, as recent as possible is what we'll often say. And there's several exceptions that are allowable exceptions depending upon a family's unique situation. Okay, uh, real estate too. And all, all of these, remember, on the asset side, this is all net of any debt associated with it. So we're not concerned with any of the debt that we might be seeing right now. We're just concerned with the value of the asset itself. Okay. Lastly, on the asset side, we have personal use assets is often the way I like to think about these. Um, these are also known as tangible assets or a common use for these. Some people refer to them as physical assets. Um, you know, again, there isn't necessarily one right word, so and that's why I have several of the common ones here for your reference point. Um, you know, in, in terms of it, what we would say is the only thing that's important about this, like when I teach it, is to make sure that we use a consistent term with a family. So if you want to say they're personal use assets, then that's what you should always call them. And nobody, I will not tell you you're wrong. If, if you see me have tangible assets on a slide and you say, I thought those could be called personal use assets, I assure you they probably can. Okay, so please don't uh, get too hung up on that, um, you know, in terms of the terminology, because again, there's different books will say different things slightly for this. Um, so personal use assets, again, um, well, and, and that's what we said. So uh, you can say a home is real estate, but a personal residence, for example, has, an, has a different tax status than investment real estate does. So I tend to keep them separate too, that I would keep a home as a personal use asset, if I have residential real estate or investment real estate, I would certainly list that under investment real estate, but I would not treat my home for that same way because when I sell my home, I get a different capital gain treatment on my personal residence than I do on something that I held as an investment property. Does that make sense? Okay, um, and and again, you know, you know, the 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 rules can sometimes be sort of uh, you know dicey and sometimes rather uh, seem seem somewhat uh, uh, you, uh, you know um, random, but they're, but they're not in many ways. So with personal use assets too, um, you know, having a market value that's good for these. So right, so right now I'm 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 wearing one of my favorite shirts. I like it a lot. I've had it for a year or two. Um, so what should I put on my balance sheet for my favorite shirt? Mind you, I think I got it at TJ Maxx. Any ideas? Or should I not put my shirt on my balance sheet? Yes. I, I, I like these comments. Keep my shirt on. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, that, that's right. Um, you know, in general, we don't put a lot of things on there like that. Um, one of the reasons, things that we would say, and someone mentioned garage sale value, you could do that potentially, but you don't even have to because garage sale, right, is something that oftentimes is, falls under the de minimis property for, for most tax purposes, so we often don't even have to declare those proceeds because, right, I'm selling a shirt that I spent maybe $10 on for 50 cents. So what would be the tax treatment of that anyways, right? So a lot of times we don't really do that. Um, so what types of assets do we want to have? Things that there's some marketability for. So large scale electronics, someone joked about a, you know, a, you know, cashing in their iPad. Well, maybe there is a market value for something like that. Certainly there's a market value for my home and we know for my car as well, right? My car, where's a great place to make sure someone can get the car value, the, the current car value that they would want to put down? Yeah, that's right, Joe. I like Joe. Joe and I are going to be good friends here, right? So kbb.com. Uh, Edmonds is another great one. So all of those, nada. Uh, so these are all pretty decent places where you can get a car value reasonably approximate, right? I mean, I've done that and then gone to a dealer when I've had to trade in a car. And, you know, that was a couple of years ago, but it was pretty not too far off from what I was being offered. So, I mean, I tended to think that it was pretty good. And I've heard a lot of good things about those sites. So for a lot of that, again, getting those values can be there. So establishing those market values are really important to have. Um, CarMax also, Peter mentioned as well, that might be a useful one too. Um, so tangible assets, long-lived assets can all be things that might be beneficial there that do have some sort of value. 
Some collector's items, maybe, as long as there's a current fair market value assessment for it, right? So I remember when I was first teaching personal finance um, at the end of the late 90s, and there was Beanie Babies. And these were all the rage, right, because people were selling Beanie Babies. And so I had students telling me that, well, if a client had that, shouldn't they put that down uh, on, the, on the balance sheet? And I said, only if there's a current fair market value at the moment for the Beanie Babies, not what they were worth six years ago, because I'm pretty sure they're worth nothing now. Um, and I could be wrong, maybe there's still a market, a secondary market for Beanie Babies, but I haven't seen a lot of it and I continue to make the joke and no one corrects me. So my point being is that a lot of things may not really have a real value associated with them that's worth reporting. Collectibles uh, definitely can and if, there's, and if there's resources to really establish those and a reasonable market for it, then we want to put it down there. The bottom line I tell everybody is that if a lender would look at this and say this would not be acceptable collateral or we're not buying that as part of your uh, making sure that you're eligible for this loan, then I'm not so sure how useful it is for us to put it on anyone's balance sheet. And so a lot of times some of those things really are not something a lender is going to look at either. And so us thinking that they're worth something to our clients when they're not going to sell them, it can be concerning. So. Right. <laughs> I like that too. Uh, so only certain Beanie Babies could have been this, the, the baseball cards. And my uncle swears that yeah, he had several first issue comic books that my uh, Bubby or my grandmother uh, often will assure everybody they, were wor they weren't worth anything. So it's, it's tough to say, right? And so a lot of us you know, could have potentially done a lot better if we sold these things at our peak. Um, and so again, I, do, I guess point these out. Uh, one way to think about these is these are assets that in many times we're likely getting some use out of, even if it's a collectible and we're just getting some enjoyment, but they may reflect more of our quality of life. Um, so again, just some things to kind of point out there uh, to keep it into perspective. Um, and I just got an update from Molly. Uh, there's been some connection issues and I know some of you have had this. Um, but uh, as we're going to be going forward here, uh, Molly will be uh, posting a link for everyone shortly uh, that has links to some of the statements that we'll see. So liabilities, right? Oftentimes we think of current liabilities as being credit card debt, uh, unpaid bills. These are all things that should be there. Um, Long-term liabilities are really larger assets, debts that might be associated with them, so car loans might be longer term. Usually these are over a year or two in nature. Now, I've seen several books that are using a third category for families, which is sort of this intermediate term, and that's because a lot of times current liabilities are taken up many times from an accounting standpoint by really what are the unpaid bills a family has at the moment. So in essence, they tell us sort of what a family's obligations look like when we do them at the beginning of the month. Intermediate term liabilities are really those things that are between a few months and a year, so they're not necessarily just our bills, but they're shorter term liabilities that we should be paying off. So this could, for example, be a credit card, which ideally we're paying off within a year's time. Um, but, you know, so the current liability might be the credit card bill. Uh, the intermediate term liability might be the credit card balance. Although, obviously, you know that some people realistically should just put credit cards as a long term liability. I bring this issue up of credit cards, guys, because you're going to have people telling you sometimes that that's not in the right place, this isn't the right place. Certainly the full balance due on a car loan, unless it's the last month due, should not be a current liability. But then whether or not you would treat certain things as long term or intermediate term is going to have a lot to do with the reality the client faces. Something's really a long term liability when it's going to take several years to pay off. The average American has about $8,600 in credit card debt. I don't think most Americans who have that level of debt or higher, is it realistic to call that current liability debt? Um, they're going to be paying on that for several years, right? If they're paying the minimum payments, they're going to be paying on it for over a decade. So I bring that up because we should treat that debt somewhat realistically, uh, if you will. I think that's an important piece going forward. Okay. Um, let's move on then. Valuation of assets and liabilities, fair market value. Liability should represent the principal owned plus any interest that will be guaranteed to be paid through, for example, to pay off from amortization or something similar. So a sample balance sheet, I'm going to skip this one and I'm actually going to move to the one for our case study. So I want to just point out a few, th oh, and Catherine, there, and you will find I never complain about those people. My whole notion about credit card debt for individuals uh, is always deals with it. And that's someone, if they're doing it that way, you know, uh, they can think about whether or not they want to, on an income statement, we'll say, 
how do they want to treat that? Do they want to make one bill that goes to credit card or make all the bills that they have and the credit card was just the mechanism for paying it? We'll come to that in just a moment, Catherine, because that's an important point. Um, so here's an example then of a balance sheet, right? Some basic assets, nothing too crazy. Uh, investment assets here, TSP, 401k plan, uh, JT. Now, what is this JT stuff that we're seeing here? So JT is joint tenancy with right of survivorship. Um, so we just tend to start documenting these things now. Uh, while we're not covering estate planning on this web conference, uh, it's always nice when we're looking at a balance sheet to think of who owns the asset. So some things, as we know, can be outright owned by a husband or a spouse um, or, or a wife. Uh, some things are going to be jointly owned. Some things will be with right of survivorship, of course. Uh, and so we just want to document some of those things as well. And so, again, we just encourage the people to do that. So this is simply what we put together for Brett and Brittany Johnson. Okay, simple income and ex uh, simple balance sheet at the beginning of the first year. And then we're going to find at the, sorry about the cutoff at the top, I apologize. Uh, but the, uh, this would then be for the second year. So some little bit of changes, some things are a little different, a little more money saved, a little more money invested. Now, one of the interesting things then to think about whenever we talk about balance sheets is understanding the differences between them. So one of the things that we'll talk about is number one, these differences here that we see, but then we're going to find that these statement of cash flows and the statement of changes in net worth will help us to decompose these into income effects, things that were caused by income coming in, and then asset effects, things that were caused by the assets themselves appreciating in value. Because that decomposition is really important when we start looking at did the money work for the client or did the client work for the money. And oh, you're right, Sarah. I'm gonna I'll put out a change for this. Thank you, Sarah. Sarah found a, a boo boo in my uh, balance sheet, but I will get that and repost it. So I appreciate that. And if you do find any errors, feel free to email them to me. I will gladly make sure they're corrected. These things always take a little tricky, Miss. So I want to then think about a few key things. Then so changes in the personal balance sheet. So when we talk about this, does everything that changes the structure of my balance sheet improve my net worth? So let's say, for example, right, that I took money from my savings account and I used it to pay down my liability $100. So I take $100 from savings and I pay $100 and reduce my liability. Does that improve my net worth? No. That's right, it doesn't, right? And that's kind of the thing we want to start thinking about is that if what we want is to help people actually improve their net worth over time, simply pushing things around on a balance sheet doesn't improve net worth, right? In fact, it's not always helpful at all, we'll see. Um, so we want to talk about that. So when we purchase a new car, right, if we take money from a savings account for our down payment and then we buy a car, and we borrow 100% of the rest of the car. So, right, let's say we put down 10%, we borrow 90%. How does that affect my net worth? Yes, that's right. It is cooking the books, right? So if I take money from savings, right, and, and, and I buy a car with it, let's say I have a, a $1,000 in my savings account, and I buy a $2,000 car, and in doing so, I now have a $2,000 car but I also took on $1,000 of liabilities. So does that really help my net worth either? It got me a car. And that's the thing we want to talk about. Not every decision we make will improve our net worth. It doesn't make it the wrong decision either. Trading in money that's in savings for a down payment on a car so that you'll still have the car then in the end is what you needed to do. It's why we had money in the first place. So some things will help our net worth. Some things will hurt our net worth. And some things will have no effect on our net worth at all. Now, it will affect our asset later because it'll be a depreciating asset. So everyone who's thinking of the next balance sheet, yes, the car will actually go down in value and we may not have paid the same amount down in the depreciation of the asset. So eventually, right, depreciating assets will hurt net worth over time, but it doesn't mean that they're not the right thing. I don't think we all can afford and go out and buy a collector's car that doesn't lose too much of its value every year. So, right, sometimes cars are a necessary thing. It's part of our transportation expense for the year. So, to recall, 
A personal balance sheet determines our net worth. Updating it periodically allows us to monitor changes in net worth, right? And we know that net worth can be negative. Now, is the fact that net worth being negative, is it always bad? <laughs> Plus nine, no. I like that. Good. Susan, great comment. That's wonderful. Good. Carolyn, not necessarily for a young person. See, this is fantastic. That's great. And you guys are right on the money. That's perfect intuition. It's not always bad. If you're young and you have negative net worth, but you just graduated from college with some student loan debt, but you have a job, right, you have negative net worth most of the time and your net worth can go up over time so that's very different is negative isn't so negative net worth is bad oftentimes someone said depending on our age a lot of times depending on how much time we have left to turn it around right so if you know many of us would say you probably need your net worth to eventually be hopefully heading to the positive range certainly by the time we want to retire we certainly it, you know it's possible to retire with negative net worth it's just not going to be very fun so we want to try and get to that point for sure. And so we ask ourselves, right, you know, again, when is it bad? Well, probably negative net worth is most dangerous for many people the older they get, the closer they get to things like retirement, the closer they get. So, right, and so someone says many military don't buy a house until retirement from military, which makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. So the income and expense statement then. Let's, let's switch gears then for some of the time we have left then. So we have a summary of a client's income and expenses over a period of time, usually one year. This may focus on realized transactions, and if so, helps us to compare to budgeted financial goals. Oftentimes, income and expense statements can be prepared in advance, right, in the form of a budget, uh, or using them to make projections for budgeting processes, which is, as we're going to see, something we'll do with it uh, for sure. So... Income and expense statement shows the money coming in, the income coming in, and the money going out, um, right? Uh, so, and many times you've heard this is a cash flow statement. Now, we're not trying to confuse it. There's a reason why I'm going to keep calling the other document we're going to talk about called a statement of cash flows rather than a cash flow statement because of the fact that many books make a mistake. So, in general, income minus taxes minus expenses uh, is going to be our surplus or deficit, and we talked before that the surplus is really what we can use for pre-planned savings, payroll deduction, um, what we can use for catching up on debt, reducing debt. Uh, I know all of you know the term power payment, so surplus can be money that's available to us from a power payment standpoint. So we have income that comes in from employment, from investments, from others, right? And this could be things like that come in in the form of benefits and perks. So that could be uh, uh, allowances that are provided to families that they might be receiving as well. Um, so savings uh, can also be something that we put on here, especially savings as an expense. And then, of course, expenses themselves, fixed, variable, discretionary expenses or common categories. And we'll break these down, of course, in more detail as well. So what counts as income? Really anything. Are loans income though? So if I have a, let's say that my spouse is in school. Oh, I like that. Full steam on and awesome. I'm going to have to check that out. Thank you, Carolyn. I'd like to see that. So if, if one member of the couple is in school and they have student loans, are the student loans to be counted as income? Good. We're all, this is something that a lot of people kind of debate. They say, well, it's what they have coming in to spend the money. Sure it is. It's not income. And in fact, if this means that by not counting it as income, that we show that a family's really spending on deficit for the year, that would be a pretty accurate statement, wouldn't it? I mean, the fact that I'm spending money, I mean, it doesn't matter that I got the disbursement for school. It's still money that I owe. And as a result, right, we really, right, when we talk about how does a family spend on deficit, how does someone spend more than the income they've earned, because of debt. The fact that it's student loan debt doesn't change that and make it less so. It's still debt. So that's really good. I appreciate that. So the reason why I bring this up is when we ask college students about this, what do you think their answer is? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. A lot of them put it down as income until they take my class, as you can imagine. But that's all common misconception they'll have that they think of it well I didn't spend more than what I made I, I still have money in the bank I'm like isn't that student loan money yes you didn't make that money and they don't see that 
So I bring that up because we may find that oftentimes people don't always see it that way, and we want to make sure that all of our families see it that way. Um, so again, student loans are absolutely there. So income and expense statements, right? Some common things to think about here. Boy, zero base question. Well, what we'll talk about, right, so this is a really good thing. When we talk about a zero-based budgeting, I don't disagree with that as long as, right, that what we're having is we talk about a distinction then between uh, surplus and discretionary cash flow, where surplus really would be this money that's left over that would include money going into uh, plan savings. Uh, but you're right in the sense that we should be allocating that extra money to savings or to specific purchases. So in the end, we can think about the fact that our income, and ex we may find that our first iteration doesn't do that, but as we start having money left over, we understand how to change those. And that's why budgeting and such is often an iterative process. But that's a really, really great reason, a uh, really great suggestion uh, guest. <laughs> so <laughs> fixed expenses, things we know we're going to have, right? Taxes, rent, loans, mortgages. Variable expenses, um, you know, this can include a lot of different things there, but we talk about utilities, food, entertainment, and some of these are fixed in nature. And so you'll say, well, gosh, you know, Mike, my, my, my utilities are really fixed in nature. They're not variable. And that can be true. And for some of them, that's absolutely the case. But what we're thinking about, right, is that, you know, some of them will be, some of them won't be. So when you're making a statement for an individual, oftentimes the way we use these terms may help us to be more flexible, if you will, in our own minds of saying, well, okay, this is what that expense looks like for you. And that's how we want to treat it so that they're able to fill, build a budget around those necessary expenses they have to have. So and I really like this too. Caroline's sharing a great resource here. And uh, Molly, I'll make sure we can get this added to our own documents too. But uh, this is the um, availability for getting this too. This is for a uh, full steam uh, built in from the uh, financial planning worksheet. So we'll certainly take a look at that too. So again, Budgeting for some of the expenses as well. Where do we get the different types of statements? Now, obviously, for, for, for families that are uh, in, in the armed services, this will be very different. But for their spouses, where are they going to collect all the statements? So we might have those coming from different sources, too. So we'll make sure that we're gathering these on behalf of the entire family as much as possible when we can, or at least helping them to understand how they bring all the pieces together to build the budget for their families. Um, so. In your experience, do people keep track of their expenses pretty well? <laughs> no. Nope. I'm waiting to see if anyone says yes. <laughs> so if you, okay, somebody said it depends on the person. That gives me hope, Pam. I appreciate that very much. Right? A lot of people allow the internet, and as we're showing the students in classes, the internet doesn't always do it right. Uh, Mint doesn't know what isn't, what isn't already recorded. Your bank doesn't know what things you're planning to do or have already outdone, although they will show you oftentimes bill pay and show you what the net pay is on that. So there's a lot of things there. Yes, only after they're seeking help. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Only after someone's told them they should have been doing it all along do people start doing it. Yes. So that's good. So Hugh's having some luck with that, and that's very exciting, Hugh, to see that. Higher ranked clients. That's an interesting point. I, I would be curious to see that. I know there's uh, some data from FINRA. I'd be interested to see if, if, if that shows up, because that would be certainly an interesting uh, just pattern to see. So I appreciate that you're sharing that with us. Um, Joe still uses a blank transaction register. Joe, I don't think that's been. And they're also older, right? So it's maybe a generational thing. Uh, so, and these are all pretty good. You know, part of it too is, you know, we've made expense, we, you know, when people first start going into spending money now, it's a lot more complicated than when people a couple generations ago first started having transactions. I mean, now we have debit cards, check, you know, uh, ATMs, cash, uh, power pay or power pay, PayPal. Uh, so I can appreciate that there's probably a lot there where they're at. And Doug's point about uh, information avoidance, um, we see a lot of that across, across this generation period. So I think there's a lot of that too. People don't necessarily want to see what it is. And that's right. A lot of people aren't writing checks anymore, which takes you know a lot of that there too. So, And we're going to talk all about these too in terms of what we help think people can cope with too because it is really challenging. So we still deal with it. Right now, many of us are dealing with it you know, on our various ends of a generation that doesn't quite necessarily, some do, but many still do not quite get the importance of this uh, until they see the resource, until someone sits down with them and makes it really easy for them or until they get into trouble, as one of our colleagues suggested already. 
So I think many things are like that. I like that too. Checkbook, uh, Caroline, I've seen that one too. I like things like that also. Again, where we're still the one taking the records. Um, some people say, do I like Mint? And I like Mint, but Mint doesn't actually get all of my accounts. For some reason, it can't sign up for two of my accounts that I have. So it's just not a complete picture of everything. And so for some certain things like that, no, none of these systems have been perfect for me yet. Um, but I think they're all, they, they might work better for others. I think Mint probably works for a lot of people as a record, somewhat of what we've had happen. But what doesn't Mint track very well at all? Those of you who use Mint, what is Mint's biggest flaw? Just by what it does by default. And most of these, they don't do this well by default for tracking sp expenses. Thank you, Natalie. Wonderful answer. They don't track what we spend our cash on right? So that's, I think, the biggest challenge there, right? Cash is there, um, right? And, and Mint is only as good as you're honest on it. I agree with that, too. So there's many, many things, right? And some banks do this now, too, where they'll keep track of what you use your debit card and bank cards for. So some of them are adding that as part of their parcels, depending upon which fee structure you have with your financial institution. So I want to point that out. Let me come to another question, though, too, which is this notion about credit card payments. So when I'm recording things, right, like I went and on my ex income and expenditure statement, I'm going to go ahead and record that I went to the mall and I bought a few things and then I went and I bought some gas and I did a few of these things. And I did all of those on my credit card. So when I go to make my credit card, whether I pay my credit card off at the end of this month or in two months, this is still the same point, right? What is the problem? If I then put my credit card payment down, what sort of, what am I doing twice now? Right, so if all I used my credit card for was to pay all those other expenses that I tracked, what's the challenge with doing it? Yeah, Susan's got it. Double entry, right? That if I really used my credit card all month long and then paid off at the end of every month for all these other expenses and I record all these other expenses, then I probably shouldn't record my credit card payment. In fact, the only portion of the credit card payment in general for people that pay it off within the year we should be recording is any interest that's accrued because that's really the new expense. If someone took their credit card and went to the grocery store and went to the mall and did all these things, all of those expenses should be itemized. They shouldn't be lumped together as credit card payment. The challenge we get into is when someone has a credit card bill that's gone on for more than a year, right? And that's of course where it happens. So right, that's very good, Doug, and Doug's got it. You should not count credit card transactions as spending except for the portion that goes to interest payments of the credit card. The interest payment is a new expense that you have that should that will affect your cash flows, but everything else the credit card was used for should have been an itemized expense. So I just wanted to point that out too as, as another comment there just to make sure from an our accounting standpoint because it helps to make sure the numbers add up correctly for individuals. So again, we've talked about this. I think at this point how someone can spend more than what they've made. So again, if we look at for our case study, a simple income and expense statement for last year, right? So we have Brittany's income, Brett's income, the housing allowance, uh, subsistence allowance, investment income uh, that they received, just a small amount there, $33, I think, in dividend income or interest income, not very much. Our savings plans that they were making, the deferrals that they had, ordinary living expenses, debt payments, insurance premiums, taxes that were withheld, and then so sort of taking a look at where they were at in terms of leftover money. So, and I don't, as I look at the clock, I won't review this too much, but I will ask you that as you review these, I'm going to put my email address in here several times today. Um, but as you review these, if you have suggestions or if you have ideas for a case study, we would love to talk to you about helping us set these up. So any comments or suggestions you have for improving case studies or for additional case studies, uh, we welcome them because we do like to teach with them. So simple statement of how we might use statements going forward, right? When we looked at those, we would say, well, is there sufficient room for savings? So just as kind of a comparison point, we would say, well, we have X amount of dollars left over. Is that enough to pay down the debt that we needed to pay down? Is that enough to put the money aside for savings that we needed to put aside? Have we been able to accomplish all of those things? If there's not, that's partly what we need a budget for. And if there is, again, that's partly, of course, what we need, um, you know, th then we're in great shape. So if we have adequate savings, then we continue to treat savings as a fixed expense. When we explore opportunities we might have for tax savings, and we monitor progress towards our goals over time. We can also, in, in, in adequate savings, reduce our expenses, increase income, if that's possible. That's always a suggestion, but not always easy. 
We could adjust our tax situation and keep more of our income if possible. And we could adjust our goals. Things like timing, the amount, whether or not we're going to try and pursue that goal at all may come up, as we can see. Okay, let me pause here, and it's time for CEU password number two. We'll take just a 30-second stretch break if you need it, uh, or, but more importantly, if you need to write down this password, please do that. So it's 255, and again, this is the second CEU password, the second of two you will need to send for CEU credits for today's web conference. Those instructions will be provided at the end, I promise. Okay, so again, 255, uh, and I'm going to move on just in the interest of time. I do want to introduce the additional statements, so I, I apologize for that. Okay, now, the budget then, right? So we've got these first statements under our belt. The budget's kind of what we want to have happen, so what do we think is going to be the case? And this can be challenging. We can't possibly anticipate everything. For those of you who participated in our calendar-based budgeting workshop, we do have a whole workshop that's archived available to you if you're interested in finding out more about uh, that approach to working with someone to set up the budget. So today we're not going to spend too much time on the budgeting process, obviously. Uh, our emphasis is more on the statements themselves. So again, we might have similar expenses. I encourage, for the purposes of budgeting, to even offer an occasional expense category. There's just certainly some expenses that we have once a year. Birthday parties, vacations, although you might save towards a vacation over the year. But birthday parties that you might have, uh, you know, for example, our client has a two-year-old child, so maybe they want to set up for that month to make sure they know they need $200 extra for a birthday. Uh, a few other types of things like that, too. So I just point that out to just make sure that we're considering those, as well as what types of things would change. And we're going to talk about the other thing we do for families with budgets. It's going to be called the what-if budget scenario. We're going to talk about that in a moment, so I don't want you to think about that just yet. This is just the baseline budget. So why plan your spending and savings, right? Again, it helps us to prepare for some of these unknown things, as well as the occasional or seasonal things that sometimes catch us off guard. So we know, right, that this is going to be, uh, over time, it involves making some projections and then tracking our reality to see whether or not what we planned for, whether or not reality lives up to what we planned for. And when it doesn't, we have to adjust the budget to reflect that so that we don't overspend or that we adjust our goals accordingly. And that's what we talked about before with an adequate savings scenario. So I know you guys have seen these before, right? Um, we've smart, written SMART goals before. Um, we talk about identifying the income amount for the months, finding bills and such. So we've done these before, and this is really a lot of what we do then for that statement. So this is just a review of the budgeting process we introduced last year. Um, but again, goes hand in hand with these statements that we've been making. Um, and as we mentioned before, you can use the money management calendar to work with that. Um, and if anyone needs copies, just shoot us an email. We do have that PDF accessible to anyone that was interested. Okay, so we talked about building the budget. The budget physically should structure-wise ideally match up a lot to the income and expenditure statement. So again, categorizing these expenses, making sure we account for our planned savings, because what we want is to be able to reconcile budgeted categories to recorded categories. So if we have a category that we're budgeting for, we should be making sure that we're tracking that category so that we can see whether or not we actually spent what we thought we would, or again, whether or not it didn't match up. Oh, very good. I like that a lot. So car licenses, fees, Father's Day, lots of things like that are going to come up. So a budget might just look something like this, right? Again, um, you know, we can take these months monies and then go back in and say what would we use these dollars for so ideally all discretionary cash flow can be tied back up and built back into the savings plan so budgeting becomes an iterative process we first of all have to figure out where we actually are see how much is left over and then determine the optimal use for it so that we replan the budget accordingly now in the time we have left I want to introduce these and we'll probably talk a bit more about these uh, just at the beginning of next week's session so that we don't go too much over in time um, oh thanks Molly for posting the 2013 money management calendar so uh, so some supporting statements so when we looked at these initial statements we had simple questions like what drove the changes in net worth and so that's where we kind of want to begin with this that in general right 
The balance sheet represents the financial picture of an individual at a moment in time setting forth assets, liabilities, and net worth. The income statement presents recurring revenues, savings, expense, and discretionary cash flow over time. The income statement then provides a partial picture of what's happened between the two balance sheet dates. But neither statement by itself, nor even together, truly gives us the entire financial picture of the household. And that's because we don't necessarily have the diagnostics for what changed and what drove the changes. So we have then these other statements that we make. So the first thing that we have, right, is going to be, uh, so we have two major statements that we make. So the statement of cash flows, which is what we're going to introduce first, I believe, um, shows the inflows and outflows and the net change in cash between two balance sheets. So this identifies the changes in some of the accounts from one balance sheet to the next. So we're going to actually then categorize these into a few major categories. In particular, we're going to have cash flows from operations, cash flows from and for investing activities, and then cash flows from investing activities, I'm sorry, from financing activities. So operations can be thought of as normal work and living for a family. Investing activities, right, are the sale or purchase of assets that we might have, so things that affect the balance sheets. And then, of course, cash flows from financing activities. Now, financing activities, as you might imagine, is cash inflows from the issuance of additional debt and cash outflows for the repayment of debt. Right, so each and every way, cash money coming in from normal family operations, money going out for normal operations, the cash itself. Cash coming in from the purchase and from the sale of assets, cash going out from the purchase of assets. And then again, cash coming in from taking on debt, cash going out from right reducing debt. Okay, so we think about those and we build in these types of statements. So let's go again to our case study. So here, I'm sorry, this says Brett's 401k. It should say Brett's TSP. So we look at some simple adjustments that take place in here. And so what we're looking at is the change in these accounts minus any contributions that went in from cash. So it's simply the amount here. So here we have what's the amount and the increases of investments from savings, right? So this is what, I'm sorry, this is the cash flow money that came in. Decrease in liabilities from principal repayments. So this is the actual amount that decreased in the mortgage balance, the actual amount that decreased in the loan of the automobile. Um, and so we look at all those, and those represent the cash flow from operations, these things that were regularly part of what we were doing. The investments then, right, so if investments went down, right, we would have to reflect those, the increases of investments from savings. Um, so looking at there, this is cash from investment activities. So the total cash from investments. And then we have cash for and from financing activities here. Uh, again, so we look at the total amounts that came in here. So this is decreases in liabilities from the principal repayments. So again, looking at the financing activities, the cash, the operations activities, and the investment activities. So what we often want to find is that we're going to see that we want these things to match up as well as possible. Now, when we talk about the balance sheet items, we're going to summarize the non-cash flow changes in net worth not recorded on either the income or the cash flow statements. So what would this be an example of? So what is a change in net worth that has nothing to do with money coming in and money going out of the household? I see some typing. Great. Changes in value, unrealized gains, depreciation, Right on the money, guys. Right on the money. So changes in value for assets due to appreciation or depreciation. If an asset other than cash is exchanged for some other assets. If assets other than cash are received by gift or inheritance. And if assets other than cash are given to charities or non-charitable donees. Why would it, if it was cash, where would it be? It would be on the cash flow statement, but it would also have shown up on an income and expenditure statement most of the time, right? So we're talking about things that weren't cash transactions. <clears throat> so for our case study, right, we have appreciation of investments, increase of investment contributions. We have, reduction, or we have reductions in net worth. So depreciation of assets, increase in liabilities, right? So increases in taxes due. So again, and then what's the net non-cash flow changes in net worth? And we take a look and say, what's the ending net worth? So when we do this mathematically, we should be reconciling on our statements. 
And that's the type of thing to check through and of course, you know, to see that the statements were done correctly. Now, in the few minutes we have left, I want to talk to you guys about using some of these statements. So number one, for families that have more and more complicated situations, so I think in mind of some of our officer families, these secondary decomposition statements may help to make sure that the efficiency of, the, uh, of our, uh, of our uh, family's actions are going well, right? So are cash flows being used appropriately? Are assets appreciating on their own? And what drives changes in the balance sheet? So for example, if net worth went down and we see that this was a lot from cash flows for financing so that the client took on a lot of debt, well, we want to make sure what happened with that, right? We want to make sure that that was made for a good decision. So, but another way that we're going to use statements is going to be for what if scenarios. So I'd like to ask some of you to volunteer to work with us a little bit over the next week before the next web conference, especially if you know you're going to attend next Wednesday's web conference. Oh, we'll come, I'll come right back to that, uh, Catherine. I'm just looking at the clock. I want to make sure we come to this question here too. So we want everybody to think a little bit about the budgeting process that families go through because this is something that we all kind of, all things that we want to talk about. Um, so when we're talking with the family, we can establish a baseline budget. But one of the things that I think can be very valuable when we work with families is to think about budgets that they can have in place should start situations start arising. So one of the things that I thought would be really helpful is if you took the budget that we've prepared for the Johnsons and then instead told us, well, let's assume for a moment that Brett finds out he's about to be deployed for the next year or for some meaningful period. I'll leave it up to you to be flexible, but I thought for the next year would simplify the budgeting question. And I was hoping you could tell me what would be different about their budget, and you don't have to do it right now. I'm talking about something you're hopefully going to email me, but um, to think about what would be different about their budget. So actually taking the budget document we're giving you that Molly uh, is making available for you to download and make some changes to it. What would be different for this family if Brett were to become deployed in the near future? How would that change their budget? And what might that, what needs might that create for a family? So we'd like for you to think about that for us, right? And if you're willing to, what we would really like for you to do is to go ahead and make, make a budget uh, and send it to me um, with, it, with any narrative that you would want to. My email address, I just posted in there again, uh, and Molly's posting the link to the original budget documents. So msgutter at ufl.edu. If you would like to take your stab at making the budget for this family for post-deployment, I'm sorry, for what happens when Brent, Brett becomes deployed, what would their budget look like? We would love it if you would send that to me this week to my email address, and we would like to then go over it, if you're okay with that, and you can tell us this in the email, uh, to go over it at the beginning of next week's web conference. We'd like to talk about what you reflected from, this, from today's web conference and what you might like to take away from it going forward. So that's just, we thought that would be a really interesting exercise, and I would love to learn from some of you a little bit about that process. You don't have to do this, so you can get the CEU credits without it, we promise, but we would love it if some of you who may have a few extra minutes and find this an interesting subject to help to shed some light for the rest of us how you think a budget would look different in the event of deployment. So if you're willing to, go ahead and take a look uh, at it and email it to me. Again, my email address, msgutter at ufl.edu. Uh, we'd love to have you um, send that to me. And again, we would just like to think about what you would change uh, to set a budget for them for deployment. So we will review then some various strategies and some mechanisms for how we will use some of this growth analysis there too. Um, so I wanted to make sure that we had those, but I see we're right at the end of time here. Um, and I will double check that, Catherine. That looks like that could be a typo. So let me double check that statement. And if so, I will make sure that we do that. Um, so, and again, any uh, things that you think should be changed as you look at those, we would love to uh, have your comments on those just to be safe. We think it's very useful for us. There could be a few typos left in there um, from an adaptation. So certainly we'll change them and get a fresh batch sent out to everyone. Um, but let me uh, then just, in the interest of time, um, reminder then, we're hoping that you'll review the case study and maybe th submit a budget projection for this family while bread is deployed, um, and then think a little bit about this. So again, uh, if you have this, um, do go ahead and send that to me. And again, my email, again, just to make sure you have it typed out, uh, msgutter at ufl.edu. So do make sure you have that. And for those of you who need to submit for CEU credits, um, again, send an email to fsawebinars at gmail.com. 
Please in include both of the CEU passwords that were given in this presentation, as well as your first and last names. Uh, emails must be received by this Wednesday at 5 o'clock, uh, so we do want to make sure you act on that as quickly as possible. Um, if you have additional questions, please make sure you shoot me an email. I will be glad to uh, con or aggregate your questions and uh, try and share some of them at the beginning of next week's web conference just to make sure we have those and if there's any corrections needed to the case study I will make those and uh, Molly will get the new version posted on the learn site ASAP but uh, thank you guys so much for coming today I know we're at 1230 and I don't want to overstay my welcome for one day uh, but I do look forward to hopefully all of you joining me next week and uh, look forward to carrying on our conversation about financial accounting for families thank you very much and have a great rest of the week